On Being is brought to you by the John Templeton Foundation. The Templeton Foundation supports academic research and civil dialogue on the deepest, most perplexing questions facing humankind. Who are we? Why are we here? And where are we going? To learn more, please visit templeton.org. The Templeton Foundation. Stay curious. A single voice of integrity can be a window into many worlds. Laylee Long Soldier is a writer, a mother, a citizen of the United States, and a citizen of the Oglala Lakota Nation. She has a way of opening up this part of her life and of American life to inspire self-searching and tenderness. And I had no idea until I discovered Laylee Long Soldier that the U.S. government offered an official apology to Native peoples in 2009. But it was done so quietly, with no ceremony, that it was practically a secret. Laylee Long Soldier's lyrical first book, Whereas, explores the freedom real apologies can bring and offers entry points for us all to histories that are not merely about the past. All of them had to be within living memory. I really wanted it to be grounded in the now, at least within my own lifetime. And I wanted as much as possible to avoid this sort of nostalgic portraiture of a Native life. My life. (laughs) I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Whereas received multiple awards, including the Whiting Award, and it was a finalist for the National Book Award. Laylee Long Soldier's mother was from Idaho, and her father from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. She now lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We spoke in 2017. A couple of years ago, I interviewed Sitting Bull's great grandson, Ernie LaPointe. Mm-hmm. And it was as I was preparing for that interview that I first learned that it wasn't until 1978 that the American Indian Religious Freedom Act uh, Mm -hmm. gave the Lakota and other tribes the right to perform their sacred rituals and ceremonies, that these things had been decreed barbarous and Mm -hmm. demoralizing in 1883 in law. Uh, It occurs to me that you more or less grew up in the aftermath of that shift Mm -hmm. Although probably when it was still in transition. I'm just curious about that, um, if that's something you were aware of. Oh, yeah. It's definitely something I've I've been aware of. I, I can't speak for all of my generation, and I cannot speak for all Lakota people. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have Lakota family who is Christian. Mm-hmm. But certainly, I, for me, it's like the more traditional teachings that are important to me, as I said before. But even learning about those things, it's something that has come slowly because, you know, you have to find the right people and yeah. the right family members and who have that kind of knowledge yeah. to share. Uh, there's a great diversity even in our own communities. And, and I think that has a lot to do with the history, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So and people had to pray somehow. <laughs> <laughs> right. So yeah. right. Right. That that Christian um aspect of things is also part of that lineage of that history even if it's a nourishing thing for people now. Mhm. Hmm. You know, I I'm very intrigued with the language that people use that other people use when they describe you. And this is bo- these are both sections from the Whiting Award citation. Um, Laylee Long Soldier is the poet architect, that's poet hyphen architect, in the arena of witness and longing. Um, are those words specifically, I mean, that's how somebody else has described you, but are those words meaningful for you? Do you know what they're getting at and, and what does that mean to you? Um. To me, I don't know, in some ways I think it's, uh, that's language that comes from an outward gaze. Mm -hmm. Um, The idea of the witness is not something that I sit down to the page with. You're not assuming the persona of the witness. Yeah. In any kind of conscious way. Yeah. Yeah. What about Um, longing? What about longing? 
Longing, I'm not sure if, um, again, I don't know if that's a word I relate to. Yeah. Because longing for me conjures up feelings maybe of nostalgia, Mm -hmm. both of which are things that I try very hard to avoid. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But maybe there is a sense of longing in there that I haven't myself recognized. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about what you avoid in the notion of nostalgia. Hmm. Well, let's say uh, with the whereas Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. pieces, which are a response to the national apology to Native Americans. um, I've often said that I felt like this was a project of constraints. So when I sat down to work on this response, uh, there were a lot of constraints that I um, placed on myself. And one of those was that I wanted uh, all of the pieces to be written, number one, through first person, Mm -hmm. I. Mm -hmm. Um, But number two, all of them had to be within living memory. I did not want to jump back a hundred years. Yeah. That's, I think so often, that's really temptation to do when it comes to um, anything that has to do with Native issues. Yeah. Um, native rights or history. And so I really wanted it to be grounded in the now, at least within my own lifetime. And I I wanted as much as possible to avoid this sort of nostalgic portraiture mm-hmm. of a Native life or life, my life. <laughs> well, to me, this also is an expression perhaps of this idea of um of dual citizenship right Mm. um and it seems to me this work takes on both sides of you if if i don't know if that's the right way to say it like you you've written Mm. i am a citizen of the united states and an enrolled member of the oglala sioux tribe meaning i'm a citizen of the oglala lakota nation And in this dual citizenship, I must work, I must eat, I must art, I must mother, I must friend, I must listen, I must observe constantly, I must live. (laughs) Um, Tell me how you, so so this congressional resolution of apology to Native Americans happened in 2009. I had never heard of it until I sat down to prepare to interview you. And I don't think you heard about it at the time. Is that right? How did you start? How did you come to be trained? How did your attention come to be trained on this? Uh, Yeah. um, I hadn't heard about the apology until months later. I think it it was signed in December 2009. And it was sometime in the spring, I think, of 2010 I heard about it several months later. And I was personally really surprised that I hadn't heard about it before. Part of the reason I hadn't is because it was so quiet. Yeah. And there really was not a lot of risk taken right. in how it was um, delivered. Well, I was, I was saying it was enacted as part of the Defense Appropriations Act of 2009, mm-hmm. which is a little confusing yeah. um, and not necessarily where we would look. And, you know, it's interesting to me because there's a lot of, I feel like just recently in American culture, we've started to entertain some new kinds of language like truth and reconciliation. And is that mm-hmm. something we might think about? Mm-hmm. Um, with... Native Americans with slavery or reparations um, or, you know, words like redemption. Um, And then there is this, here's tucked away, is this resolution that was passed but never really, never spoken aloud, right? Never really offered Mm -hmm. publicly. Right. I mean, I'm just going to read a little bit because because probably other people haven't heard of it either. This is just the beginning. (laughs) To Mm -hmm. acknowledge a long history of official depredations and ill-conceived policies by the federal government regarding Indian tribes and offer an apology to all Native peoples on behalf of the United States. 
it talks about the fact that Native peoples inhabited the present-day United States for thousands of years before the arrival of people of European descent, that they honored, protected, and stewarded this land we cherish. And then it says, whereas, whereas the arrival of Europeans in North America opened a new chapter in the mm-hmm. history of Native peoples. And then it <laughs> continues to whereas, 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 and mm-hmm. whereas. <laughs> mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you discovered this, and um, yeah, what was your reaction? I, th- I think, well, first of all, what... what motivated me to even respond to the apology was the delivery. So that's the Mm -hmm. heart of it. Mm -hmm. Or I should say the non-delivery of the apology. Yeah. But then I went online and I read the apology and then I was like, oh my gosh, the the language. It's so careful. (laughs) Yeah. It's so carefully crafted. I mean, my goodness, these guys are poets. Like... (laughs) I mean, very astute and very aware of what each phrase, how how do I say it, uh, you know, what each phrase may carry, yeah. the implication of each phrase. Yeah. So even the phrasing of um, the arrival of Europeans opened a new chapter yeah. for Native people. That's crazy. It wasn't opening a new chapter, you know, that's yeah, that's almost poetry. I mean, that's a very interesting way to to look at what happened, right? Mm. So, and going further into the document, um, you know, just the idea, for example, um, they never mentioned genocide, right? Yeah. yeah. Things are phrased as conflicts. Um, lives were taken on both sides. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, yeah. things like that. Both took innocent lives. <laughs> including those uh-huh. of women and children. Yeah. I mean, they do say, you know, the infamous trail of tears and long walk. But, yeah, you're right. It's very spare and careful. Right. You know, I mentioned this to a group of students recently um, at the University of Washington, but I'll mention it here as well. I was watching this really nice video, um, a little talk by Faith Spotted Eagle, She's um, Dakota, uh, and she was the only Native woman to receive a vote from the Electoral College in this last um, 2016 election. election? Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, She's an amazing, um, beautiful woman, a wonderful speaker, too. Um, And so anyway, I was watching this video, this little talk she was giving, and she was talking about the idea of discussing um, history, discussing some of these traumas that have happened. Yeah. And she was saying, for Native people, talking about these things, it's important to process of healing. Mm Mm-hmm. And for me, I think it's not just healing. I would add to that a sense of justice, mm-hmm. you know, being heard. And then on the other hand, she said for non-Native people, hearing and listening to these narratives, these histories, yeah. and engaging in a conversation that is not about guilt and it's not about shame, it is about, in her words, I think she said, um, freedom from denial. Mm-hmm. It mm. allows a liberation. So I think that that's really uh, maybe what was important to me in this work, you know. And I didn't want to jump back 100 or 150, 200 years. Uh, I didn't want to jump back to Wounded Knee or Sand Creek. I wanted to say this is what it's like here and now, you know, in my own lifetime. This is not history. This is not old history. It's present Mm -hmm. in my life, in my child's life, my daughter's life, right? Um, Someone recently asked me, a little bit embarrassing, um, they pointed out how many pieces include my daughter <laughs> in them. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so true. But and it, I was a little embarrassed just because I didn't want to seem obsessed. But um, 
I think that that was important to me as well. Um, it, that that it's, not, it's not of, just not the past. It's, it's the present and the future, right? right? It's, the, it's the world we're that's creating. Right. Exactly. Krista Tippett, and this is On Being, today with the poet Laylee Long Soldier. You know, I feel like we're talking about something very specific, but we're speaking in a moment of time of incredible fracture. And there's a lot of apologizing that hasn't happened, and, and we're actually building up a lot of things that are going to have to be apologized for. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, so one thing I find really interesting that you do in Whereas is um, it's not just that you're not only talking about history. You're, you're also bringing in intelligence from life about what an apology is and, mm-hmm. and how when apologies are done well. I mean, and this is things that neuroscientists are studying too, right? Mm. Just what you just said. I mean, you, they can now watch someone give a real apology and have it received and have it start changing things in their brain. Um, really? Yeah. I didn't. But know it that. has to be sincere. <laughs> but it has to be sincere, right? Uh-huh. And there's there's eye yes. contact, and so you register right. that you register that. Anyway, so right. you wrote in the beginning at the actually the beginning of your response. Whereas, when offered an apology, I watch each movement: the shoulders high or folding tilt of the head, both eyes down or straight through. Um, I listen for cracks in knuckles or in the word choice. What is it that I want to feel? And mind you, I feel from the senses. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) This feels like really important deliberation. Like this isn't, this is something we need to learn to do together. Right. right as a people <laughs> in that part of your citizenship yeah there's the physical presence the energy that is important but on a national scale i mean it's also not just a personal apology so there's things that um are bigger than us bigger than having just let's say you know a family member sit down next to me and apologize mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. at a national level there's a lot more that goes with it, right? Um, when I was writing this response, uh, I started researching a lot of other apologies around the world, mm. um, national apologies. One of the apologies that I was really interested in was the one in Canada. Yeah, um, to the First Nations people. To the First Nations, right. Yeah. Um, on the boarding school, the residential schools for what happened there and the taking of their children and so on. And that apology was read out loud. It was like a verbal speech. It was um, transmitted through um, their national television. And it had a very different quality. There was a very different quality to the language and the pacing of that apology. Um, I always remember there was this one little, uh, short interview with, uh, an elder, uh, Mm -hmm. an elder native woman, and I can't remember her tribe, but in any case, so they asked her if things had changed and she said, in her opinion, no, things had really not really changed, but she said in just very, very simple terms, She said, you know, if you want things to change, all you have to do is begin by honoring your treaties Hmm. and doing what you said you would do. But I think there has to be a a kind of trust building in order for any, any kind of apology to be effective, whether it's interpersonal or at a national level. I mean, one of the things you pointed out is that, um, and this was President Obama who signed this, um, Mm -hmm. but it was signed on a weekend. It was not read aloud. There was no ceremony, Mm -hmm. and there were no tribal leaders invited to witness it. 
Um, right. And that ceremony is an important way in tribal culture to make something meaningful or to signify that something has meaning. Mm-hmm. I think it's important in tribal culture, but I think we have ceremonies all the time yeah. at the White House. Yeah. Yeah, it's a human, <laughs> it's a American human thing. culture yeah. too, right? Right. right. Yeah. I mean, it seems like there's all kinds of ceremonies going on over yeah. there at the White House. <laughs> like, you know, like Yeah. <laughs> Here's Laylee Long Soldier reading some lines from her book, Whereas. I did not desire in childhood to be a part of this, but desired most of all to be a part, a piece combined with others to make up a whole, some but not all of something. In Lakota, it's hanke, a piece or part of anything, like the creek trickling behind my aunt's house where uncle built her a bridge to cross from bank to bank, not far from a grassy clearing with three teepees, a place to gather. I think of plains winds, snow drifts, ice and limbs, the exposure, and when I slide my arms into a wool coat, and put my hand to the doorknob, ready to brave the sub-zero dark. Someone says, be careful out there. Always consider the snow your friend. Think badly of it. Snow will burn you. I walk out remembering that for millennia, we have called ourselves Lakota, meaning friend or ally. This relationship to the other some but not all still our peace to everything short break, more with Laylee Long Soldier. We are putting all kinds of great extras, poetry, music, and a new feature, Living the Questions, into our podcast feed. Get it all as soon as it's released when you subscribe to On Being on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen. Support for On Being with Krista Tippett comes from the Fetzer Institute, helping build the spiritual foundation for a loving world. Fetzer envisions a world that embraces love as a guiding principle and animating force for our lives, a powerful love that helps us live in sacred relationship with ourselves, others, and the natural world. Learn more by visiting Fetzer.org. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Today we're exploring the perspective and poetry of Laylee Long Soldier of the Oglala Lakota Nation. She has a way of opening up this part of her life and of American life that inspires self-searching and tenderness. She's the author of Whereas, a book of innovative poetry written as a contemporary response to the little-publicized congressional resolution of Apology to Native Peoples, which was tucked inside the 2010 Department of Defense Appropriations Act. While you were writing this, Standing Rock is in the public eye, in the public imagination, this kind of ongoing drama. Um, One thing you've said about that is how intrigued you were about the community, the tribal community, taking a position of remaining prayerful, of having Mm -hmm. that be ceremony, no weapons. Mm -hmm. Um, And in some ways, I think, struggling with people who were coming to be in solidarity, um, but that being the position that the Standing Rock elders took. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. 
And what should I say about that? <laughs> well, I'm I'm just curious about how you are watching that, have watched that, um, and how does it flow into this other exchange you were ha- you've been having by way of just thought and poetry um, with the larger picture of uh, the. Um, this history and this um, struggle still to reconcile this history? Um, It's kind of funny. Um, Yesterday I was just, I just had an interview um, with someone else um, and we were talking about this idea of prayer. And so it's something that I'm, I want to be really careful um, in talking about because I certainly don't want to come across like uh, some new agey type person or uh, some guru or something. But I think that um, I have thought a lot about um, both at a community level and on a personal level, this idea of prayer being central to an ability to enact, even to take, how do I call What? How would I say it? I almost want to say um, a prayerful inaction. Uh, I don't know. No, those are not the right words. But um, I think what I've been thinking about a lot is at Standing Rock, um, I have a few friends there. And how firm that community has been on on keeping prayer as central to everything that they do, Hmm. right? Hmm. Um, And I think that that's something very beautiful and unique that Standing Rock has offered to the world of resistance. Hmm. And that's not to say that other movements have not had prayer in at the center of what they do either. No, but but you're right. It's and it's. I mean, even that word resistance, which has very much entered the lexicon right now, and I, not very often, I'm not hearing it attached to prayer um, mm-hmm. in other contexts. I mean, the other thing about that is that it was, it was really in reading you saying this about the community taking a position and remaining prayerful. I realized it was true, and that it had come through in what I knew, but it's not prioritized in like coverage right it's not Mm. the headline um and so i think it's so important for you to say that like to to speak that for people to hear that too and be looking for that because um uh standing rock is going to be with us right and i think that yeah every um movement and every community they have their own culture, their own values that sort of propel the action that they take, right, to yeah. create yeah. change. Yeah. I don't know if many people are aware of, aware that, of that, how yeah. important prayer is to Lakota life, mm-hmm. but I always get a kick out of it. I had a nephew who was um, complaining to one of my cousins, my sister, and he was saying, Oh, it's hard to be Lakota. All we do is pray, pray, pray <laughs> all the time. <laughs> so it's like, and, and yeah, I just got a kick out of that. So, you know, it is, it's a very real thing. Yeah. And so it is something that um, I have really appreciated and loved mm. um, seeing how that really um, influenced every step that the community took, I felt. And it's something that I've heard from people who were, who went up to Standing Rock. It was why I think so many people had a good experience there because there was that prayer and that sense of connection, that community. Um, and and it, all different. kinds of religious figures, all kinds of religious leaders also gathering around with their prayers. Yeah, ultimately, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know how you feel about the language of like Native American spirituality. But I, f- I find it dangerous. I worry about it being thrown around 
and appropriate. Yeah, that doesn't mean a thing, actually. It doesn't mean a thing, yeah. No. I mean, listen, the thing is, is there are over 560 federally recognized tribes. And that's just federally recognized. There are um, many more that are not recognized, who are, many of them right now are, are seeking recognition. But the point is, is um, all of us are different. Yeah. And all of us have um, um, beliefs and ways that are particular to who we are as a people. So, you know, Lakota um, beliefs are very different than, let's say, where I live here in the Southwest from Pueblo. Some of my friends from Santa Clara Pueblo, let's say, or Hopi friends or Dene friends. I mean, all of us, our, our traditions and our ways are all so, so different. You know, our stories and, and they're also so connected to the land. Yeah that we come from there's there's not a separation it's connected yeah so native american spirituality right. is just an awful term it's yeah like, <laughs> yeah it, yeah it's scary it's so broad and yeah yeah abstract yeah and it could be so, very very superficial and out of context right yeah. i think one of the most striking just sentences that i've read heard in the context of what's going on at Standing Rock is uh, and I should have written down but one of the elders or maybe the maybe the chief saying you know water is not a resource it is the source of life mm -hmm. and that is a statement of fact right I mean mm -hmm. it's it's just we never it's not a way we say it or think about it and mm -hmm. it's such an the whole Drama really is such an interesting. Uh, I mean, it's so many things, but in in you know, in, the, in if you look at that sentence, it's um, an amazing testament to the power of how we formulate and understand. You know, something like what is water, right? <laughs> and how right. a word like resource that gets thrown around, and I throw it around all the time too, like crazy. It's like one of the big words now can dehumanize us and be a way into into belittling you know, yeah, the absolutely. source of life. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, all of these things for first of all, I really I, I feel like I have to I'll constantly put out disclaimers mm -hmm. um, before I ever talk on some of these issues because you know I I just I'm so wary of of sounding like I'm talking for for all Lakota people and and all Native people, and I'm certainly not an expert mm -hmm. on any of these issues. But it is again, it goes back to this idea of relationship and seeing it in that way. I mean, even just for example, one of my friends posted something really funny on uh, Facebook this morning, I think, and she was uh, reminding people in their, um, she, what was it, I think, Red Willow. This is a season for getting Red Willow. And she was saying, now everybody be careful and don't, you know, take more than you need mm. and leave the plant, allow the plant to stay alive for the next, um, the mm. next year, right? Yeah. So it is always like, even just things like that, you know, like little Facebook posts or what have you. I mean, it's still alive, this awareness. Right. Um, the sensibility. That, a sensibility mm -hmm. of connection. And you don't see the red willow as a, um, a resource. Right. There you are. Right. Something you just take from. Right. It is something you take from, but you do it respectfully. Right. Mm -hmm. And the same applies, of course, to water and this source of life. I wonder, um, you mentioned a, a little while ago that you're that you do talk about your daughter a lot in, in your poetry. And, I know. Um, no. And I, I, like, I talk about my, my children in my show. Um, I, I wondered if you would read and, and maybe this will like, 
put you at ease about it, because I'm not I'm, you're not speaking for you're just speaking for yourself, right? But but a single voice of integrity and searching is a window in, right, to a world mm-hmm. in a way that often asking somebody to represent a group in fact is not. Um, there's this part in whereas there's the part that I couldn't write the page whereas mm-hmm. her birth signaled the responsibility as mother to teach what it is to be Lakota. Mm-hmm. I, I don't. Do you want to read that? Just the like the. Oh, okay. Let's see, let me find it. Okay, or maybe I'll read the first two. They That's seem fine. kind of connected. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Whereas, her birth signaled the responsibility as a mother to teach what it is to be Lakota. Therein, the question: What did I know about? being Lakota, signaled panic, blood rush, my embarrassment. What did I know of our language but pieces? Would I teach her to be pieces? Until a friend comforted, don't worry, you and your daughter will learn together. Today she stood, sunlight on her shoulders, lean and straight, to share a song in Dene, her father's language. To sing, she motions simultaneously with her hands. I watch her be in multiple musics. At a ceremony, to honor the Dene nation's first poet laureate, a speaker explains that each people has been given their own language to reach with. I understand reaching as active, emotion. He offers a prayer and introduction in heritage language. I listen as I reach my eyes into my hands, my hands onto my lap, my lap as the quiet page I hold my daughter in. I rock her back, forward, to the rise of other conversations. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Today, with the poet Laylee Long Soldier. I'm always kind of pursuing and the way each individual life is its own way in to this question is you know what what does it mean to be human um, and I also know that that every one of our sense of that is all constantly evolving across life but there are some things you've said about writing that I just find so intriguing I feel like the way you've written about them is how writing forms you as a human being like you wrote somewhere mm. um it's an endeavor I grew into and now provides a solid, deep joy. Perhaps this joy from writing is seated comfortably in my core because of the life lesson it's provided. Writing has shown me what happens with patience. Hmm. And someplace else you wrote, the surprises I've experienced in my writing pr- practice have dislodged me from curiosity into love. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I wonder if you could say a little bit about those qualities and as a way into the question of what you've what you're learning about what it means to be human through the life mm-hmm. you lead um i think the writing practice um it was something that i had not expected to be a good fit i had never thought oh i want to be a writer one day But I went to the Institute of American Indian Arts, and um, they didn't have a music program. That's what I wanted to study. Oh, right. (laughs) But I really wanted to go to school there. So I felt like the next best thing was to study writing. 
And um, it was not easy. A lot of, uh, I would say the first three, three and a half years, I wrote some really, really, really bad, bad, bad poems, like really dry. It took me a long time. But I think it was that patience that is something I've learned through writing, a sense of patience and the reward Mm -hmm. that comes from that. Even I'm just now thinking about the piece 38, but that piece, for example, took me, I want to say maybe a year and a half to two years to write, but it was important to me. It's kind of, it's an epic piece. It's like six pages long. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Would you just briefly say what's happening in that piece? In 38? Yeah. Just briefly, in 38, it's uh, written to and for the Dakota 38, who were um, 38 Dakota men who were hung under the orders of um, President Abraham Lincoln um, as a result of the Sioux uprising, which came at a time when Dakota people, their um, territory, their land was was getting smaller and smaller yeah. uh, and finally down to a, something like a 10-mile tract. And the people, Dakota people did not have... Um, hunting rights beyond that Uh, and basically um, and they had no uh, store credit with the traders and so they were basically starving so there was an uprising and um, as a result um, these 38 men were hung and then Dakota people were um, moved west to South Dakota Mm -hmm. area in different um, Basically, they lost their land. This was the largest legal mass execution in U.S. history. Yes, that's right. And it happened the same week that President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Yes, that's right. This history we don't know. That's right. Or we don't teach. Um, Yeah. So so you were just talking. So this took a long, this emerged through patience, writing all of this. Yeah, absolutely. I I just think... um, that I've learned through writing the reward and the joy that comes out of just being really patient with a piece Mm -hmm. and patient with yourself. I think, at least for me, the imagination is something that I have to really respect like its own little person in me. (laughs) And so I can't demand too much of it. Sometimes I have to let it take a rest Mm -hmm. and then come back Mm -hmm. and be in conversation with it again. But it's a beautiful process that Mm -hmm. I've learned through writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was looking at page 64, Mm -hmm. whereas I did not desire in childhood, and also page 65, which was another, you know, part of the way you also reflected on what an apology is. Right. Is about your experience of a really big apology that came from your father. Mm. Um, and I, I think that we don't often enough value the intelligence we have about something like an apology, even if we're thinking about that as public work, um, the intelligence that we have from our personal experiences. We don't understand that that translates to... So anyway... Well, yeah, I actually would... Um I might mention that the piece about my father, the apology he gave me, I really do actually consider that almost the heart of this whole response. Mm. And I think um, the reason is, I think it was the the most uh, effective and the most miraculous um, apology that I'd ever received in my life. I think... um, Now, I should clarify before I say anything that my dad and I have a pretty good relationship now. Yeah. We, you know, keep in touch and visit and text and call each other. But when I was younger, he wasn't around a lot and he had a lot going on in his life. Yeah. So um, that created a great emptiness and, 
you know, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Um, so I had a lot of, a lot of stuff I was carrying around with me. And um, when I was in my 20s, he came to visit one time and unexpectedly he was sitting at breakfast with me and apologized uh, for not being there. Mm-hmm. And I think there was something in the way he said it. He cried when he said it. And I could feel it. You know, I yeah. could f- physically feel that he meant it. And really, and I can say this to this day, in that moment, all of it was gone. Like all that stuff I'd been carrying around, it just, it was gone. It was lifted. Hmm. And I feel in many ways we started new from that point mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. You know, I ha- I really have not had the need to go back and rehash things with him and, and so on. You know, we started mm-hmm. a, a, from that place forward, we've known each other in a different way. Mm. Do you want to read that? Oh, okay. Whereas... I heard a noise I thought was a sneeze. At the breakfast table, pushing eggs around my plate, I wondered if he liked my cooking, thought about what to talk about. He pinched his fingers to the bridge of his nose, squeezed his eyes. He wiped. I often say he was a terrible drinker when I was a child. I'm not afraid to say it because he's different now. Sober, attentive, showered, eating. But in my childhood, when things were different, I rolled onto my side, my hands together as if to pray, locked between my knees. When things were different, I lay there for long hours, my face to the wall, blink. My eyes left me, my soldiers, my two scouts to the unseen. And because language is the immaterial, I never could speak about the missing. So perhaps I cried for the invisible, what I could not see doubly. What is it to wish for the absence of nothing? There at the breakfast table, as an adult, wondering what to talk about if he liked my cooking, pushing the invisible to the plate's edge, I looked up to see he hadn't sneezed. He was crying. I'd never heard him cry, didn't recognize the symptoms. I turned to him when I heard him say, I'm sorry, I wasn't there, sorry, for many things like that curative voicing an opened bundle or medicine or birthday wishing my hand to his shoulder it's okay I said it's over now I meant it because of our faces blankly because of a lifelong stare down, because of centuries in sorry. Laylee Long Soldier is a visiting assistant professor of poetry at the Iowa Writers' Workshop in Iowa City. Her book of poetry is Whereas, a winner of multiple awards, including the Whiting Award and a finalist for the National Book Award.
On Being is Chris Hegel, Lily Percy, Mariah Helgeson, Maya Tarrell, Marie Sambilay, Aaron Farrell, Lauren Dordal, Tony Liu, Bethany Iverson, Aaron Colasacco, Kristen Lynn, Prophet Adewu, Casper Tech Kyle, Angie Thurston, Sue Phillips, Eddie Gonzalez, Lillian Vo, Lucas Johnson, and Damon Lee. Our lovely theme music is provided and composed by Zoe Keating. And the last voice you hear singing our final credits in each show is hip-hop artist Lizzo. On Being was created at American Public Media. Our funding partners include the George Family Foundation, in support of the Civil Conversations Project, the Fetzer Institute, helping to build the spiritual foundation for a loving world. Find them at Fetzer.org. Calliopeia Foundation, working to create a future where universal spiritual values form the foundation of how we care for our common home. Humanity United, advancing human dignity at home and around the world. Find out more at humanityunited.org, part of the Omidyar Group, the Henry Luce Foundation in support of public theology reimagined, the Osprey Foundation, a catalyst for empowered, healthy, and fulfilled lives, and the Lilly Endowment, an Indianapolis-based private family foundation dedicated to its founders' interests in religion, community development, and education. On Being is distributed by PRX, the public radio exchange, and is a Krista Tippett public production.